Hi, this is Craig Stocks. I'm doing a short video to explain my workflow, which is primarily Photoshop for astrophotography photos. And I'm going to be talking about the picture of Orion. And this is a final version, so we won't be taking it completely to this level. But this is a final version of hydrogen alpha and oxygen combined in a starless version. And then I also have a layer where I can turn on a starred version. So some of the capture and processing details, because I'm sure someone will ask, uh, <clears throat> it was captured with a Takahashi FSQ-106 on a Skywatcher EQ-6R Pro mount. Uh, it's using an ASI 6200mm monochrome camera with both hydrogen alpha and oxygen 3 filters. Uh, exposures varied from 2 minutes to 10 minutes and to be honest I kind of lost track of what all I used in the final image because it's a combination of, of different data. Uh, it's all controlled by ASI Air Pro. So that's some of the details. Basic workflow, uh, I'll do the captures and those are saved on a jump drive on the ASI Air Pro. Uh, I can take that into the computer then and download the FITS files. And what I have found works best for me is to do my stacking in Photoshop. So in order to get the, the data out of a FITS file, uh, generally a raw converter like Lightroom or Photoshop won't be able to read a FITS file. So you have to use a tool like FITS Liberator. Uh, which is distributed by, by NASA and, and other organizations. And it has the ability to read and to apply some different stretch algorithms to stretch the data. Uh, you basically just click on Open File, navigate to the folder that you're using, choose, unfortunately, one file at a time to open. And then you can use different stretch algorithms, uh, linear, uh, arc sine, logarithmic, uh, exponential with uh, either fractional exponents or whole exponents. And basically experiment with these and also with the uh, black and white point sliders to find a combination that gives you good detail in the darks without blowing out the highlights. I generally wind up using a fractional exponent uh, on a log x, like uh, x to the fourth I think is what I'm using here. And as you slide this back and forth, you can adjust the white point. And I have clicked Freeze Settings over here. And what that does is it retains these settings until I change them. So if I open a subsequent file or files, uh, it'll keep these same settings. So I can quickly cycle through two or three or four or 10 or 20 files just by open, save, open, save, open, save to create a TIFF file from each one of these FITS files with some stretch applied to the raw data. And I feel like it's important to apply as much stretch as I can to the raw data because that's when the, the file is going to be the most flexible. What it creates is a, I have it set for a 16-bit uh, TIFF file and it'll come out as a grayscale. So let's go to Photoshop and I've done this once for the hydrogen data and again for oxygen data. So let's look at the hydrogen. What I'll do when I go to Photoshop is just go to File, Scripts, Load Files into Stack, and this will load those individual files as layers in Photoshop. So again I would use Browse, navigate to the folder with the uh, TIFF files to open those, and those will open into layers like this in Photoshop. They're not going to be aligned. You know, with Depending on how good your tracking is, they may be close, but they won't be perfect, at least in my experience. And if you've had a meridian flip, some of them may be upside down, so you'll need to deal with that as well. What I find works best for me is I will just select all the layers in the Layers palette over here on the right and go to the Blending mode and change the blending mode to lighten. And what lighten does is it takes the pixels from all of the layers and shows the lightest pixels in every layer. 
Uh, so it's kind of a superimposed or overlay. And let me turn off the top layer and focus on just the middle layer. If I tap V for the Move tool, I can click and drag to move this layer around. And you can see it's showing the brighter pixels because the stars are brighter than the background. And I can very easily move this around and align the stars in that layer to the bottom layer. And if you need to, you can zoom in close and you can use the cursor keys to fine tune the position to get it as good as you want. Sometimes you may find a little field rotation, especially after a meridian flip. Most of the time, uh, all you need to do is do a simple move to reposition. At least that's been my experience. Once I've got that layer aligned, I'll turn that one off, turn on the next one up, be sure to target that layer, and then use the Move tool to again align it to the bottom layer. And you always want to align everything to the same layer so that you don't have an accumulation of errors. And again, you can use the cursor keys to fine tune the position and get it just where you want it. Once that's done, and there typically would be more layers than this, uh, turn on all layers. Uh, the top layer is usually the last one you worked on, so it's selected. Just shift click on the bottom layer and that will select all layers. Change the mode back to normal. And at this point we're ready to stack. So what I would do is right click over here and convert to smart object. And when you right click you need to right click to the right outside of where the name is so that you're not renaming the layer but rather uh, executing a command from that pop-up menu. If you don't get the pop-up menu then perhaps you didn't click over far enough. And of course you can also use the layer menu to create a smart object. Now that we have a smart object I can go to layer smart objects stack mode and here we have a choice of lots of different options the two most common are going to be mean or median. Depending on the data, uh, I will use either one. Uh, I probably tend to use median more often for two reasons. One, um, median will tend to ignore any data. Well, so I had to stop to take a phone call, but uh, rather than starting over, I'll just continue on. Uh, I think I was saying that under Layer, Smart Objects, Stack Mode, you have different options. And the one I probably use more than any uh, between Mean and Median, I tend to use Median the most. And the main reason is if there's something in just one frame, for instance, a satellite came through or an airplane, uh, it will eliminate that where mean will tend to average that in so you have a little bit of a ghost image from it. Uh, also if you have single pixel noise that shows up in different places in each frame, median will just kind of automatically remove that because it's only in one frame in one position whereas mean will tend to keep little ghost particles from that. So I tend to use median most of the time. So since that's what I normally use, that's what I'll use in this example. And you'll get a little progress bar that's on the other monitor showing that it's rendering the image in stack mode median. And then when it's done, you'll see the, the little icon over here. And usually at this point, you're kind of done with the process. So I will just right click on it and choose rasterize layer because I'm, I'm done with all those and that reduces the file size. Now at this point it's still a 16-bit grayscale image and that's okay for now. It just keeps the working memory a little bit lower. This is the hydrogen layer so I'll just double click on the layer name and rename it hydrogen to keep track of things because over here I have already done that to the oxygen data so I've already aligned and stacked and you'll notice that it's upside down. So before we drag it over, I'll just do a uh, free transform with Control T. And I can right click and choose rotate 180 degrees. 
click the check mark to indicate I'm done. So now it's turned in the same orientation as the uh, hydrogen data. And let's rename it oxygen. And with the move tool active, I can just click and drag up to the tab that has the oxygen. And while still holding the mouse key down, drag back onto the image area. And if you hold down the shift key, that will paste this layer aligned to the same location. Now, because of the meridian flip and everything else, this probably won't be aligned, so we'll have to go through that same alignment process. So I'll switch to lighten mode, and sure enough, we can see that it's not in the same place. So I'll drag it into location, and we do have some, some field rotation here. So control T will bring up free transform and this little crosshair in the center shows kind of the what will be the center of movement or rotation. I'll align this star and then drag the center of rotation over to that star. Now I can zoom out and grab the use the rotation tool in free rotate or free transform and rotate the field may need to zoom in to see exactly what's going on out here and adjust my rotation to get these stars aligned. Now, you'll notice that they're just a little bit on the outside. So I'm going to move it back with the cursor keys, about two clicks, so that we're aligned in this corner. And then I'll zoom out and zoom in to the far corner to see where we're at. And sometimes with sometimes with changing focus, it will change the magnification a little bit. And it looks like it has changed just ever so slightly. So since I'm now aligned out here, I'll grab the center move it out to this corner, zoom back into this corner, and let's fine-tune our rotation and our position. Looks like I need to make it a, just a touch smaller. I'll hold shift and alternate so that it resizes uniformly. And now I have pretty well aligned the stars from the hydrogen and oxygen data. Just a little bit of a tweak here, I think. Some of these stars aren't round. I didn't necessarily choose the best frames for this example. So, so we'll, we'll say that's good and click OK. And you can see that it, it, we're not going to be able to use the full frame because we did lose some. So now we have the oxygen on top of hydrogen, and I'll turn this back to normal blending mode. Generally, the next thing I do is remove the stars and, and then create a star layer. And to do that, I'm going to focus on the hydrogen layer because for whatever reason, I tend to wind up using the stars from the hydrogen layer. And what I have found works best, uh, generally you rely on the dust and scratches filter to remove stars. Uh, I like to take care of the big stars manually first. So I'm going to keep this layer intact. Control J to make a new layer. And then choose the spot healing brush, which is the top tool in the healing brush. Use the right bracket key to make it a little larger and just manually take out some of the larger stars. The, it, it seems like that works best uh, because dust and scratches sometimes has trouble with large stars. So you can do this a couple different ways. Um, you can just go at it with dust and scratches. You can also try to do a selection of the stars so that you're a little bit more focused. Uh, I wouldn't say one always works better than the other. So let's try using the uh, 
the selective approach. So I'll start by going to select color range and I've chosen highlights and you can adjust how how bright of highlights you want to select and you're going to typically wind up selecting some nebula along with it and then also the fuzziness slider will let you adjust that and the goal is to try to get all of the stars selected and I want to unselect this nebula so I'm going to just quickly go into quick mask mode and tap B for the brush tool make it get the right size and just paint with black at 100% opacity to take that nebula out of the selected area. Now it's going to leave some stars that we'll have to deal with manually but better to deal with a, a few stars manually than to uh, lose some nebulosity. So now we've got just the stars selected. I'll turn off the quick mask mode and I'll go to select, modify, expand and it depends on the resolution of your image and the size of the stars and so forth but uh, I'll try a 10 pixel expansion and what that will do is expand the area around each star and then I usually go back to select, modify, feather and feather a few pixels so that we get a soft transition. And by zooming in, you can see just what's selected around the stars. And you can also see there's a lot of little stars that, didn't, that haven't been selected. Now, we can turn off the marching ants selections with Control H. So that selection is still there. It's just the marching ants are hidden. Now I can go to Filter, Noise, Dust and Scratches and by adjusting the radius, which is how big an area is going to be patched, and the threshold, which is what to look for, we can find a, a setting that will pretty well take out the stars. You'll see in some cases there's going to be a little bit of a halo, and again, some things we'll have to fix by hand. So I'll say OK. And that got rid of a lot of the stars. At this point, Control H will bring back the selection. Control D will deselect. And I'm just going to go ahead and grab the uh, healing brush and fix a couple of these right now. And we know we're going to have to fix some in here manually because they were inside the nebula. And Let's do a dust and scratches again to see if we can get rid of some of the smaller stars. And this time I'm going to do it without making a selection of a color range. So filter, noise, dust and scratches. And this time I'm going to use a smaller threshold so it will pick more stars because there's not much difference, but a much smaller radius so that we retain as much detail in the nebula as we can without losing the, uh, you know, without keeping the stars. And that looks like a pretty good balance. I could maybe even take the threshold down, click OK. So that has pretty well kept the nebula. We've still got a few stars here and there that I might just go around and touch up by hand. Uh, we could also keep using the dust and scratches filter, but this is good enough for now. One trick is go back to the original layer. The bottom layer has the uh, original with the stars on it. If I make a copy of it, drag it up above the hydrogen layer, and let's put it in darken blending mode. What that will do is, if we happen to have lost any of the dark details, it will restore those details. And it doesn't look like much is coming back, but we'll go ahead and, and use this. Just do a Control E to merge down. So now we have what I would consider a starless layer. In order to create the stars, I'll go up above the oxygen layer and create a new layer. 
and I'm going to rename my hydrogen hydrogen starless. So I'll go back to the new layer we just created, and what we want to do is subtract the stars on the hydrogen layer from the starless layer, and that will leave just the stars. So, and again, like in Photoshop, there's lots of ways to do things. I will go to Image, Calculations, and I will choose the layer Hydrogen as Source 1, and I'll choose Starless as Source 2, and Subtract as the mode. And if you get them backwards, you'll get kind of a dark gray field with black dots on it. If that happens to you, just reverse them, put the starless on top and the stars next. And there you see a preview of a dark field with just stars on it. And that's just the difference between these two layers. When I click OK, and I have the result output to a new channel. And you'll notice this layer turns red, and that's because it, it actually created the output on an alpha channel. So if I go to the channels palette and go down to alpha 1, that's where the, that image was captured. I can just control A to select all, control C to copy, go back to the layers, go back to the layer panel, go back to layer 1, control V, and there are the stars. And if I put it in lighten mode, for instance, I can see the stars. I'll zoom in a little bit. If I turn off the layer one, no stars. Stars, no stars. And, of course, you can stretch this a little bit by adding a curve and choosing to clip that adjustment layer to the stars and adjust just the stars separate from the nebula. And that's really the purpose of creating this star layer. So I would now, let me turn this off, I would now need to do the same thing with the oxygen. So control J to duplicate the oxygen layer. And of course you want to do this after you've aligned everything because you need the stars for alignment. Uh, let's just quickly do dust and scratches. And we'll, we'll just start out fairly aggressive. Say OK. I'll do the same thing. I'll take the original oxygen drag it up above, put it in darkened blending mode to restore any dark detail, control E to merge down. Um, let me just manually take out a few stars and we're... I'm going through this pretty quickly because this is supposed to be a demonstration, not torture. If you have more stars than you want to deal with manually, we can, just another trick, duplicate this almost starless layer, apply the uh, dust and scratches filter more aggressively, so get aggressive enough that it really gets rid of all of the stars, and of course it's going to you know, play havoc with the nebula there. Click OK. But now, if I add a layer mask hiding all of that, we now are seeing through that, that very starless layer onto the one with stars. I can simply grab the brush tool and paint with white to reveal the very starless layer. And a lot of times you can be you know, pretty pretty crude and paint with a, a large brush over large areas to take out those stars that are away from the, the main nebula of interest. 
and then control E to combine those. We now have an oxygen starless. And I'll just turn off the, the two originals. So this is the place we wanted to get to. We have a hydrogen starless, an oxygen starless, and then a stars layer that has just stars on it. So at this point, we're still in a grayscale image. I'm going to go to image mode, RGB color, and don't merge. And what this will do is create the red, green, and blue layers so that we have a color image that we can work with. And let's work with hydrogen first. And we'll want to do two things with the hydrogen. We'll want to stretch the data, and we'll want to add color. So, and we're going to use curves for both of those. So first I'll add a curve that we're going to use to stretch. So just you know, kind of the usual stretching process. And we'll say something like that. And a lot of times when you do that, some stars may show up. Just go back, grab your spot healing brush and take those out if there's not too many of them. And it may also reveal some artifacts from the dust and scratches that, uh, that you'll need to come back and take out as well. Next we want to add some color and I'm going to do that. I see a lot of people copying and pasting into the channels and I like a non-destructive workflow so that you can always go back to where you started. Uh, by flattening the and rasterizing these smart objects, I've lost that to some extent, but that was pretty early in the workflow and something that I can recreate if I need to. <clears throat> but pasting into the channels and then uh, directly adjusting those channels is kind of irreversible, and every time you adjust pixels, you run the risk of introducing artifacts and errors that are going to multiply over time. So I prefer to do it non-destructively, and also I prefer to do it in ways that keeps the file size to a minimum. So what I'm going to do is add a curve on top of the stretch, and in the curves panel, normally you're adjusting RGB all at once. What I'm going to do is adjust red, green, and blue individually. So since this is hydrogen and I want to map hydrogen to red, what I need to do is essentially turn off the green and blue. So if I go to the green channel and just grab the top right, drag it down to zero, I've effectively removed all green from the channel. Now I'll go to the blue channel and again remove all the blue. So now I have just the red. And it's that simple, and if for some reason I want to have a little bit of blue, I can bring some blue back in. If I like a, a more purple red, if I want a more yellow red, I can go to the green and let there be a little bit of green in the red. So I can kind of fine-tune the color to whatever I want without messing with the, uh, the channels directly. And I'm, what I'm doing here is really working with the channels indirectly. So let's do the same thing with the oxygen. I'll go to the oxygen starless, and first we'll throw some stretch on it. But now, since this is up in the middle of the layer stack, we'll need to clip this curves adjustment to the layer. And again, we'll do just kind of a traditional stretch to bring out more of the data. And again, we've got some some star remnants starting to show up, so we, we'll go back to the, the starless, what should have been a starless layer, and remove those. You, know, there's, you could probably make something of an argument that you should do some of your star removal after you've done some stretching because it reveals more of the stars, and I think that's true. Uh, the balance is that the more you stretch, you're also stretching and bloating the stars. So you want to try to keep the star size as small as possible when you do the extraction. It, it's, it's pretty easy to make stars bigger, it's hard to make them smaller and have them still look good. So now we'll do the same thing with color. 
I'll add a, another curves layer and again clip it to the preceding curves layer. In this case we want green and blue for oxygen so all I need to do is turn off the red. And now we have the cyan color for oxygen. If I come back to my pixel bearing layer, put it in lighten mode, now we let the oxygen kind of shine through on top of the, the hydrogen and we can then come back to the star layer. We can decide if we want stars on or off and let me go to our curves here. There's some some brighter background so I'll, I'll darken the background and maybe brighten up the stars just a little bit so that they seem to fit and that's kind of the basic workflow for uh, narrowband imaging. Uh, if you have sulfur data, you would just do this three times, and you would decide by how you manipulate the curves whether which colors you want to come through, whether it's red, green, or blue, or a combination of red, green, and blue uh, for each different gas that you're trying to represent in the layers. That's my basic workflow. Uh, I find that it works better for me than trying to use DSS. Um, as a result of the way I work, uh, I generally do not use uh, darks and flats and bias frames, uh, mostly because I don't have a good way to apply them. Those have to be applied uh, really to the raw data, and because I'm using Fitz Liberator to extract the raw, uh, I don't have a good way to apply them but I have found the, the camera and telescope that I'm using uh, don't need a lot of that either. So let me know if you have any questions. Uh, there are other things that we can talk about, but this has probably gone on far too long now. I appreciate you hanging in there if you're still with me, and let me know if you have any questions. Thanks.